All right, so today I'm going to talk about some of the systems we've come up with to really increase the amount of marker assisted selection we're doing here in the peanut breeding program at NC State. Uh, we've implemented low throughput SNP genotyping at three major points in our cultivar development program. First, we want to verify that all the parental plants in our crossing block are what we think they are by ensuring they match the whole genome sequence with WGS reference we have for that line and a handful of markers. Second, we want to confirm all our presumed F1Cs or actual crosses by verifying their heterozygous and markers known to be polymorphic in the parents. And third, we want to genotype all the early generation material, which we consider the F2 through the F5 in our program, at large effect markers in order to implement marker assisted selection or mass. Our ultimate goal here is to be able to adopt a speed breeding approach where we move all the early generation material to the greenhouse and hope to turn three or more generations per year. This would allow us to concentrate our field resources on implementing genomic selection and extensive testing on later generation materials. These markers, uh, at least initially, will target five different traits. Uh, if you want to find out more about how we're finding these markers, I'll refer you to a poster of one of our program's graduate students, Cassie Newman. Uh, but the five traits are, uh, first is high oleic, which is about as easy as they come in terms of markers. Uh, the second and third are disease resistance integrations from both the A. cardinaceae and the A. digoi populations. And the fourth is pod size and shape traits, which are uh, allegedly highly heritable and obviously important for a program that focuses on Virginia types. And then fifth, we're starting to see evidence of at least one major yield gene. This gene is fixed in elite material, uh, but is a, of importance when making wider crosses, particularly with material out of our wild species program. So in order to do this, uh, we kind of constructed a three-step process. Uh, the first part of that is we built a manual seed core or chipper. Uh, we call it a core because the sample it takes is more of a core than a chip, but seed chipper is certainly the more common term. It's capable of sampling 384 seeds in a few minutes without affecting germination. Uh, most of the presentation today will focus on this machine. Uh, being able to genotype off seed is real important to our group because our main field station is two and a half hours away, and that makes tissue sampling a nightmare. Uh, then we run the seed chips through a crude DNA extraction protocol. It's fairly routine in plant, gen plant genetics. Uh, the goal here is speed and keeping costs low. And the third step is a custom multiplex SNP genotyping system where we're running multiple markers in the same reaction. Again, the goal here is speed and keeping costs low, but at the same time, this also will simplify data analysis as well as the selection process. So here's a picture of the machine. Uh, it was built in the NC State Bio and Ag Engineering or BAE machine shop uh, with the help of the two guys pictured there at the top, uh, Neil Bain who is the supervisor of the shop and really helped me with the design of this and Robbie Hickman who's the machinist there and the one that actually built it. It consists of three parts. Uh, the first is just a standard arbor press that you see in the back uh, and that we heavily modified. Uh, the second part is the actual sampling apparatus in the middle consists of 24 biopsy punches that we modified mostly by removing the ring um, on them here. We also cut them down to shorter length and rethreaded them. Uh, these are actually used in dermatology to remove moles and other problematic areas of the skin. There is a sharp blade at the tip down here and these tips are also easily interchangeable uh, so they can be swapped out whenever they get dull. Uh, so you stab whatever your target is, the sample gets picked up in the tip and then the plunger here at the top uh, we'll eject the sample uh, whenever you want to. And we have a custom built base at the bottom. Uh, it's really made to hold the two types of microplates that we're going to use throughout the rest of the process and, and cover in the rest of the presentation. Full device costs us about $7,000 to build. Uh, that includes a handful of missteps along the way and was split pretty evenly between raw materials and labor costs associated with machining. Uh, we could probably drop that lower to around $5,000 since we know how to build it now. Uh, ideally, we'd love to turn this more into a robot, uh, but we're not sure we have the budget or even the throughput to warrant that. So then we place one seed in each well of a 24 square well plate. On the left, we have an empty plate, and I label the columns and wells here in marker just to make it a little more clear. Uh, and then on the right, we have a plate full of seeds. Actually putting the seeds in the wells is one of the more time consuming steps here. Then the 24 well plate slides perfectly in the groove cut in the base. On the left, uh, it's empty, so you can see where the groove is, and on the right, you have the plate locked in position. Uh, what this does is it ensures that each punch is centered over its respective seed. That way, the sample will only be taken directly from the center of the seed, 
the germ is going to be on either side of the seed is always going to be missed and therefore the viability or the ability of the seed to germinate is always going to be maintained and you don't have to worry about orienting the seed in the right direction ever. Um, we've tested this ability to maintain germination both in the greenhouse and the field. Now we're on to the actual sampling step. Um, you pull the handle on the arbor press down, all 24 punches move down simultaneously. Uh, on the left hand picture you'll see the punches still above the well and the middle picture of the punches have descended into the well and when fully depressed they'll take the core out of the seed. Then you'll push the handle back up, the seed will remain in the well and if you look closely at the right hand picture you can see the sample hanging down uh, out of the bottom of the tip in the blue circle. So after the sample has been taken the 24 well plate is removed uh, from the seed chipper. Obviously each seed has a coordinate within the plate Currently, we're labeling these plants by hand, but we're working on implementing barcodes or QR codes that digitize and track all this. The plates are capped, and then you can either store them at room temperature or in the cold room, depending on how long you need to keep them. Uh, the plates do stack nicely on top of each other, which facilitates storage. The only slight problem here uh, arises due to differences in the height of the seed. Most of the seeds are punched perfectly, and those are indicated by the green boxes in the picture, where you have a nice little core taken right out of the middle of the seed. However, taller seeds will crack. Uh, you can see that in the red boxes. You can grade seeds into SELKs, ELKs, etc., and that'll reduce the cracking, but uh, to us it really isn't worth the effort because the cracking has no effect on germination. Uh, and again, we tested that both in the greenhouse and the field. Uh, we also kicked around some more ideas on how to prevent this cracking, uh, the most promising of which was to individually mount each of the punches on their own spring. Uh, again, uh, since germination really isn't affected, we're, we're not sure that's worth it. So the seed cores from four 24 well plates go in a 96 well plate in the same way that you know a 96 well plate fits in a 384 well plate. Uh, we use cardinal directions to name the four 24 well plates, calling them northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast, depending on which quadrant of the 96 well plate they'll be occupying. Flat metal sheet then goes over the grooves on the base. Uh, you can see this in the blue circle on the left-hand picture. Uh, the handle just helps you move the sheet. The 96 well plate then goes on top of the sheet and the point of the sheet is it allows you to move the 96 well plate around to all four quadrants. Uh, again, each sample gets a coordinate within the 96 well plate and all the 96 well plates will get labeled or barcoded and this allows you to tie each seed sample back to its original seed. So the two blue circles in the left hand image highlight handles that are attached to a solid metal plate. Uh, this whole piece then moves down and pushes the plunger on all 24 punches simultaneously ejecting that sample into the 96 well plate. Uh, the center image shows uh, samples with only the northwest quadrant full of the plate, while the right-hand picture uh, shows a full 96 well plate. Once the plate is full, you're on to your tissue grinding and crude DNA extraction, both of which are pretty standard stuff. Uh, we use a bead loader pictured here on the left to rapidly put a metal grinding bead in each well. You seal it with standard cap mat, and you grind it or shake it in your standard bead mill like the one pictured on the right. DNA isolation, uh, really nothing novel here. I know it's routinely done in peanut, a lot of other crops. I did my PhD in cotton, so I just use a modified version of the protocol I use there, which is cited at the top of the slide. I've been adding a nice four rotor deep well plate centrifuge like the one pictured is nice. We thought about automating this with a robot, but didn't see too much advantage in doing that over just using a 12 channel repeater pipette. Uh, the goal here again is to reduce cost and time as much as possible. Uh, the other is that since the seed core should give you a consistent sample size, the DNA quantity or concentration should be fairly consistent across samples. So the goal there is then to get the DNA concentration to the sweet spot of about 1 to 10 nanograms per microliter in every well. Uh, that will let you skip the quantifications and dilutions, which are a major source of time uh, and expense. And if you can skip those, you can go straight into genotyping. Well, working at a realistic pace, a single purse can go realistic pace a single person can go from their seed sitting in a bag or envelope to DNA uh, for 384 samples in under two hours. So we used to use a generic single plex genotyping. Um, we use a master mix called PACE 2.0 which is just a cheaper generic version of the more popular cast except that this one's optimized for use with crudely extracted DNA. We use 384 well polycarbonate plates set by a robot although sometimes it's just as fast to set by hand with a repeater pipette if you don't have a robot. Then run those PCRs on standard thermocyclers and analyze with a standard microplate reader. 
The two uh, tricks that we do here are one, in our system, the beneficial allele is always hex tagged and therefore plots to the y axis, while the undesirable allele is always fam tagged and plots to the x axis. And you should see this more clearly on the next slide. And the second is that allele calling is done with a custom R script we wrote that gives us a lot more flexibility to play around with the data than you, you might not find with a prepackaged software. So in single plexing, uh, we started to notice it was pretty easy to start grouping markers based on fluorescence pattern. Polyploidy is obviously going to play a role here in making it difficult or even impossible to make every marker have the same pattern. Uh, but on the screen, you see uh, four markers, and all of them are displaying what we found to be the most common pattern in which there's the desirable allele will cluster around 0.4 on the x-axis and uh, 1.4 on the y-axis, while the undesirable allele and green here uh, tends to cluster around 1.3 on the x-axis and 0.7 on the y-axis. It gets a little dicey with the heterozygotes as those clusters tend to move around, but they're always in the middle between uh, the two other clusters. Uh, so then we started to wonder what would happen if we pulled these four markers together equally and, and ran them as a single reaction. So we started with inbreds so that we could ignore heterozygosity and kind of make that a little easier on us. Uh, we had already also singleplex genotyped all these inbreds in our program, so we knew how many desirable alleles they had and how many undesirable alleles. We also already had high quality DNA isolated via Kyogen kit, which was quantified and normalized, so we're kind of cheating a little bit to start here. Uh, but the results are much greater than I expected them to be, as you can see in the graph here. And also note that this graph is in alleles, uh, so everything is doubled. Uh, the lines we knew were fixed for the beneficial allele at all four markers form this uh, nice green cluster in the top left, uh, while the lines that we knew were fixed for the undesirable allele at all four markers uh, form this nice red cluster on the far bottom right. Uh, you get a little separation between lines that are carrying either two or three of the uh, beneficial alleles you see with the orange and yellow clusters, um, but it's still very easy to make selections and there's clearly room to add a lot more markers to the pool. Our goal here is to turn this into more of a continuous line rather than just settling for the street cluster. So next we moved on to a smaller panel of inbreds, increased the reps and additive negative controls, which are represented by the cluster of black dots down here in the bottom. Um, the DNA was isolated in the process outlined today, no quantification normalization. As you can see from the graph, it gets a lot messier. We lose the discrete clusters, but still able to make effective selections. Depending on what kind of selections you want, uh, you can take this in a handful of different directions. You can use it to purge obviously inferior individuals like those in the red, side, red circle or you can use it to fast track obviously superior individuals like those in the green circle. Highly unlikely the system's gonna be perfect, especially as the level of multiplexing or marker number increases, uh, but we envision this being highly successful at rapidly increasing the proportion of favorable alleles in the F2 and the F3 generation, so that by the time you hit the F4 or the F5 generation, you should mostly be working with lines that are fixable for all the favorable alleles with low side of interest. Haven't really been able to try this on segregating materials yet, uh, mostly due to COVID. So I'll close uh, quickly outlining the pros and cons. The big pros are the reduction in cost, the increase in speed at which you can genotype and a simplification of the data analysis and selection of which seeds to advance, which basically becomes the hex to fam ratio. Um, and the cons here, again, that you might give up a little accuracy in terms of selection, but we think the increase in numbers we can handle as well as by possibly adding a third or fourth generation a year will more than compensate for that. Um, also, all the markers in the multiplex pool are going to be weighted equally, and we lose the ability to determine the exact allele status of individual loci, but we're okay with that because we're assuming that if a marker is valuable enough to warrant marker cis selection, uh, then it's a trait you're absolutely going to want to have in any future cultivar. Therefore, they're all roughly equally valuable, and you only want to be making late generation selection material among material that's fixed for all of them. Uh, that's pretty much all I have, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, just reach out to me via email.